Hey, good afternoon everybody. How you doing? It's Steve. Welcome to the Little Little Wood Shop and our Sunday evening blog. All right, what do we have for you today? Let me just, let me grab a pole of some caffeine. It's been a long weekend. Mm. All right, this week, this week's article was kind of uh, brought about by one of you. Uh, and forgive me, I'm not good with names or remembering them, but a gentleman wrote in and he was kind of curious about all the different router bits and, and their function and, you know, the different styles. So this week we have uh, CNC router bits and their uses, okay? Yeah, we know why I need these. Okay. Why so many router bits? And we'll go off the, uh, I'll go directly off the blog itself to try to keep this timely, all right? Why so many router bits? What's their purpose? Which bit do I use for a specific function? Does the material I'm milling make any difference in which router bit I use? What is a router bit profile? How long do they last? What are their, uh, what's their longevity? Are they expensive? What do they cost? Okay, these are all questions that I've been asked by a lot of you. Uh, these were questions I had years ago when I, when I undertook this, uh, this career field, okay? There are probably as many router bits today as there are uses for them. Uh, certain bits have specific functions at one function only, whereas others you can multitask and use them for multiple things. I have acquired several bits. As you can see to the right, there's, a, there's a, just an entire wall of tooling there, and it ranges from bits and taps. Certain things uh, I, I will probably never use again, but you don't throw out your tooling, that's for darn sure. Although I do have uh, a CNC machine, obviously, I still have handhelds because there are there are some, some jobs out there that I just can't justify, especially uh, if it's not production work. I'm personally not going to set up my machine that's going to take me hours on end to get everything dialed in to run one four foot strip of molding because we told you before our machine maxes out at 50.249 by 38 point, I'm sorry, 39.230. All right. So there's no money to be made if I've got to go through all this lengthy time and setup, whereas I can run down to a mill yard and I can buy the piece of molding that I'm looking for. All right. I kind of pick and choose my battles these days the best I can, okay? The materials are also going, uh, that you choose are also going to have effects on your tooling. Uh, feeds and speeds are always a concern. Your cut, your cut depth and your feed rate uh, will change with material densities. What you mill for feeds and speeds in pine, you're going to obviously slow down depending upon the size of your uh, either router or spindle. As I've told you many times, a smaller machine, maybe a bench top with a one to one and a half horsepower uh, router on it, is not going to drive that bit as fast as if you had a three to four kilowatt spindle, okay? Nor are the feeds and speeds going to be the same either because you're dealing with a lower uh, powered device. Not that that's a bad thing, but there are variances as to what you're allowed to do depending upon the equipment that you own. All right. Wood density is measured by the Janka scale. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the Janka scale, it's how much pound footage is required to drive an 11.28 millimeter or a .444 inch ball into the material. To give you an example, uh, Eastern White Pine requires 380 foot pounds of force to drive that ball, that .444 inch ball, into eastern pine, but yet Australian bloke, which I believe is a form of ironwood, takes over 5,000 uh, pounds uh, per square foot. There's a big difference there, all right? The same is going to be said about how fast you're able to mill those two different materials. Okay, tooling life. No tooling lasts forever, okay? But steps can be taken to maximize the life of your bits, all right? Feed speeds, plunge depth materials, your, your particular router or spindle, they all contribute 
to how fast you're going to uh, you're going to burn your your mills out and your bits. The only thing that this shop mills is wood. We've told you that we do wood composite, uh, HDPE, or anything like that. But I don't do any metal work up here. So I'm only going to be able to discuss with you, ladies and gentlemen, the wood aspect of life. All right. Feed rate. Okay. Feed rate is measured in IPMs or inches per minute. So that's how fast you you have your gantry move your milling head, which is either a router or a spindle. Uh, it's measured in inches per minute as to how fast the device can drive the material, uh, I'm sorry, drive the bit through the material. Larger machines can have faster feed rates. Spindle speeds are basically the RPM or the rotation per minute uh, off, your, uh, off your router or your spindle. Again, it's measured in, in rotations per minute. Most of my milling is done between 12 and 16,000 RPM on my Milwaukee. Industrial, uh, industrial grade spindles, your big, big, big commercialized stuff. Well, of course, they're going to run faster than my little three and a half horse Milwaukee plunge router that's attached to my machine. However, they do pack a much bigger price tag. Okay, step down or your plunge depth. It is exactly as it sounds. How deep into the material are you going to set your router bit? The deeper the bit goes, you generally lower your feed rate. You're not going to try to take a quarter inch end mill, bury it an inch in, and try to drive it at 200 RPM. More than likely, you're going to overheat and snap the bit, okay? Too deep and too, too fast creates excess friction and or tool breakage. Step overs, okay? A step over is the cutting distance each bit makes in a tool path. Well, let's say you're running a, a simple quarter inch end mill. You run a 50% step over on a 250 thousandths inch bit, 50% of that is 125 thousandths, or an eighth of an inch would be, oh, excuse me, would be your step over. I generally do not do a step over of more than 60%, and I generally never cut more than a quarter of an inch deep because that is what I have found to be comfortable for my particular machine. Again, I don't believe any two CNC routers or spindles are the same and they're all going to orchestrate uh, a different setting and outcome. Chip load is the amount of material cut per tooth. Uh, the chip size will help you to adjust your feeds and speeds. You don't want to create dust, you want to create chips. Uh, correct chip size helps to pull the heat away from the tool and it will ultimately add to its longevity. You do not, you don't want to mill to the point where you have dust flying around. You want chips hitting the table on the floor. If the bits are cool to warm, you've just run a piece, your router or your spindle shut off. If you go to touch your bit and it's cool or it's lightly warm, or even a little hot, that's not too bad, but if it's so hot to the touch that you can't hang on to it, well guess what? You need to readjust because you're overheating the bit, you're going to lead to premature uh, failure, or you're going to end up heating it up and breaking it. So make sure that your chip load is, uh, is correct for your particular piece of equipment. Feeds and speed calculations, okay. CNC router bit types rely on fe a feeds and speeds calculator. Each manufacturer has a recommendation for its product that is to me is merely just a starting point, but at least you have a spot to start from. Okay, online calculators are available. You can enter in your bit and your information. We have included an outbound link in the blog so that you can click on it. It will bring up a uh, a feeds and speeds calculator, you can enter in the information and it will spit you out the answer to where I feel is a starting point. Again, it's not the gospel of CNC, but it gives you a good idea of where to start. You're going to need to understand the rest of it and dial it in to your specific piece of equipment. Um, a basic formula that I keep on hand is the chip load multiplied by the cutter's diameter, multiplied by how many flutes or cutting edges that you have on the bit itself, multiplied by the spindle speed 
that you're running it at will ultimately give you your feed rate or a starting point for that particular bit. If we do the formula in the blog, you come up with a starting point of about 120 inches per minute or 120 IPM. Again, you will need to dial in and tweak things to your specific piece of equipment. Because again, I run a three and a half horsepower router, but if I had a three to four kilowatt spindle, I've got a little more bang for my buck, and it's going to incorporate, in my opinion, a different feed and speed. All right. Carbide or high-speed steel? Well, up here we know that we mill a lot of pine, much like this beautiful headboard behind us. Uh, they each have their advantage and their disadvantage. Uh, the two main factors are cost and tool longevity. High-speed steel mills cost half of what carbide do. Carbide, however, is the industry standard for engravers and fabricators. Carbide has a longer tooling life but its cost is exactly more substantial than that of high-speed steel. Our shop utilizes both of these bits. I use high-speed steel end mills specifically for my softwoods. Now we do have a couple carbide bits but when we get into uh, some of the much more harder and denser hardwoods but when it comes to pine what I have found with cedar and what I have found with, with softwood pines you hit one knot hole, you've just gummed up with sap, and you can gum up an entire bit just like that. So it's not that the bit becomes junk, but I don't need to go spend an exorbitant amount of money on carbide to do a cutout when a high-speed steel mill will work for me just as well. When they do get caked up, uh, I use an average over-the-counter cleaner from a local hardware store like you would soak your saw blades in. I put them in a disposable aluminum tray that you buy from the supermarket. I soak my bits and I clean them up with a really light nylon brush. Okay. Climb or conventional cutting direction. Routers spin, and I, I can't speak for spindles because I think spindles you can control the rotation, I believe, uh, at your uh, your control panel on your computer. However, my, in my particular case, routers only spin in a clockwise motion. CAD software gives you your choice to set your machine's cutting direction, which way the gantry is going to rotate the z-axis, whether it's clockwise, which is conventional setting, or counterclockwise, which is the climb setting. The difference in the two functions is how the material is cut and removed. Conventional cutting, clockwise, pushes the bit into the material and climb pulls the router bit away. If I were to do a comparison on this, uh, I think that a climb function is like trying to pull an automobile backwards while it's in drive. All right? The climb direction creates less tear out in the material. There's advantages and disadvantages depending on what you're using. For certain hardwoods and softwoods, depending on how you run them, can create strings or splinters or it's it's kind of one more of those things that you need to experiment yourself with okay router bit types and their uses are numerous router bits come in as many shapes and sizes as there are the functionality for them many accomplish specific tasks while others multitask Manufacturers make tooling uh, for set materials like wood composites and plastics. They do make specific bits to perform specific functions in specific materials. I try to buy things that are multifunctional that will kind of be an all-purpose, if you would. In my own milling operations up here, I generally don't use more than four bits. I use my spoiler board bit because I've told you we're 300 square feet up here and we don't have... Uh, I don't have room for a commercial planer. I, I just, I don't. And my small DeWalt is only capable of 13 inch wide material. So my spoiler board bit does all my flattening on my larger, larger slab stock like this. We do have, we do have video on, on that stuff. I know that a lot of this is confusing for some of you starting out, but please bear with us. We're going to get into a little bit more of the specifics. Okay, end mills are the multitaskers. All right, 
end mills probably have some of the largest functionality in your shop. I don't know of any shop that engraves wood or fabricates in wood, even in metal for that matter, composites or plastic, that do not have end mills, all right? They come in many different sizes and diameters for your collets. End mills will have one or more cutting edges, also referred to as flutes. More flutes create less chips and give a cleaner surface finish. There are, I, there are upcut mills that pull the chips up and out of the way. And there are down cut end mills that push the chips back down into the material. Now depending on what I'm doing, again, if it's a piece that I feel I can't secure very well to my table for whatever reason, which generally is very inoffen, I would specifically use a down cut mill because the force is going to push the material back on the table. I have used a large up cut. I've pulled the material right up off my table out of clamps, which is coincidentally now why we screw everything to the spoiler board. Uh, because an up cut end mill is pretty powerful and the larger ones can pull your material right off your table. But for the right reasons, if you're, you're milling really deep, especially deep pockets, I like an upcut because it pulls the, uh, the chips up and out of the way and then the dust collector can suck them up a little bit easier. Okay, Ball nose. If you do any 3D engraving, you have ball nose end mills, all right? Ball nose bits offer great detail and smooth contours while removing maximum material. Intricate carving you would try a tapered ball nose for the best surface, surface finish and minimal tooling marks. V-bits. If you do a lot of two-dimensional engraving or you have things that are specific to a certain font, then by God, you have V-bits in your possession, okay? Uh, V-bits or V-groove bits are your tool of choice. They give the greatest results especially, like I said, in high detailed font. They are available in 30, 60, 90, and 120 degrees, as well as an array of different sizes and diameters, okay? For not just the, uh, the collet, for the shank, but also the overall outside diameter of the bit itself. Spoiler board bits. They are also used for more than just cleaning up your spoiler board, like I said. I run a 1.5, yes, I'd like a 3 or a 4 inch. The shop isn't budgeted for one of the big, big, big ones. And a 1.5 on my small table or even a tabletop machine, is, in my opinion, is, is plenty good uh, as far as size go. I use a 1.5 for the slabs to get, them, to get them flat, to do our beds and our headboards and things like that. So I have no problem using that 1.5 uh, inch maximum outside diameter. Okay, other bits. I purpose, purposely buy my router bits from a dedicated supplier. I've used normal bits that you can go down to the hardware store and buy for, say, a handheld router. In a pinch, I get in a bind, I can run down and I can grab something. Although, what is used for CNC varies greatly from what's used in, say, a handheld router. That handheld router is, is going to be used to quickly perform a function for you in record time. It's not really meant, in my opinion, to sit for four hours in a collet, but I have used them and they do come in handy in a pinch. Specific bits. We have a nice article in here that talks about, we'll highlight these real quick, uh, the functions that are done in some of the specialty bits that you would say use on a router table or a handheld. We can perform these exact same operations on our tables, okay? If we wanted to make a V-groove pattern in the, uh, in the material, we obviously are going to use a V-groove or a V-bit, all right? If I wanted to make a chamfer, uh, chamf uh, chamfer excuse me, I could use my V-bit my 60 or my 90, I can do an offset in my program to cut off one side of the bevel, leaving one side. I've told you that even the latest kitchen table, as well as the cribbage table that we just donated to our fine young people, okay, we used a 90 degree V bit right at the base. I did an offset in the program. I left the bevel. All right? 
a dado. There are specific bits. And a dado, uh, much, like, much like a chamfer, okay, can also be done in more than just your CNC machine. All right? Dados and chamfers can be done on table saws. Uh, your table saw can do a chamfer, let's say, by angling uh, the bevel on your, uh, your table saw blade. You can set it at a 45, you can put your bevel on one edge, and you can adjust the fence for the profile of that chamfer. You can also do it with a handheld, you can also do it in the machine. Same with a dado. A dado with an end mill can be done on the machine, a dado can be done on a table saw with a dado blade. Uh, much like the Diablo you see behind me, and it can be done with a handheld using an end mill. Okay, a rabbit. A rabbit to me is nothing more than half a dado on the furthermost outer edge. No special tooling is needed. A straight bit, an end mill, or again a dado blade on your table saw will accomplish this. A cove. Let's say you want to do a cove profile. We actually have. A nice, uh, a nice brand new, oh my goodness, can the letters get any smaller? A round nose bit. This round nose bit has the profile written right on the side. It can do, this one can do up to three quarters inch wide, three eighths deep, and all the information is on the back as far as total overall tool length. Now a cove, again, you're probably most used to seeing cove done on molding. Well, in this case, we would run that uh, we'd run that that bit into the material. We'd do an offset in the program again on cutout. You'd have your uh, you'd have your cove. Same thing would apply with a round nose uh, bit. And if you wanted to make a round nose profile, that bit would also be used to create flutes and say a door casing or a say a nice hearth surround. You'd put the nice flutes in using this bit. There's so much that a lot of some of these bits can do to perform more than one action. A roundover. To me, a roundover, uh, excuse me, a roundover is best met in either a handheld or a router table. Because again, the smaller machines like mine can only run four feet. If I need a piece of cove molding that bad, I'm gonna go buy it from my local lumber yard. Okay? The mighty dovetail. These are probably out of all the different router profiles and joinery. I love dovetails. I love making them, but again, I would go swipe my buddy's dovetail uh, device, bolt it to my counter, and I'd use it with a handheld router. It's just how I would do them. It's not to say you can't do them in the machine, but again, you've got to go through all the setup when you can do something sometimes with handheld tools that work twice as fast. Okay, specialty router bits. What do we mean by specialty router bits? Well. Let's say you, uh, you're looking for a specific profile on a kitchen door. They make bits that will do all sorts of different raised panels and, and outer edges and, and all sorts of specific functions. For you to have a good, a good router bit supplier, this one I can't stress enough. I have bought lower grade uh, end mills and I got what I paid for. They prematurely failed, they heated up, they were just made out of low grade materials. Something that creates a bad finish or a bad edge that requires hours of sanding, to me doesn't save me any money up here. You're going you're gonna to lose cash, whether it's in time or tooling or whatever the case is. Buy the best bits you can personally afford in my opinion. Okay, I have personally had a very good relationship with a gentleman who's been in this industry a very long time. Uh, we're not affiliated up here, and I told you folks, if ever we have affiliate links, we will be honest enough to let you know. But this is just another small business owner. Uh, I've built a good relationship with him. Uh, he is the owner of U.S. Router Tools and Mr. Joey Gerard. I cannot stress this enough, no matter who you, who you decide to buy your bits from. If I have a question that I need answered, I want to associate myself with somebody that says, okay, Steve, this is going to be your bit. You're going to be able to do this, this, and this with it. Or if I have a specific job and I want to send the information over and say, 
Joey, I'm kind of hung up on something. Can you suggest, if you don't have a supplier who can recommend what you need for a specific purpose, personally, I get rid of them. Because I don't have time to, to play around up here. I, I need to get my job, get it done in a timely fashion, get it out to my client. Again, another question I've been posed, do I purchase a starter kit or do I buy my bed separately? Contact your supplier. Let that supplier know what your product line is. I'm interested in doing A, B, C, and D. It doesn't do me any good to spend exorbitant amounts of money on bits I'm not going to use. I dial in my product line with my supplier. Steve, these are what I recommend. I've never had a problem with Joey. I've never had a problem with U.S. Router Tools. Joey's a great guy. He's a small family, uh, small, small business owner and family man. I enjoy associating myself with individuals like this. Okay, storage. You've gone out and you spent all this nice big money on your bits. They come in these little plastic cases. Uh, this is my 90 degree V bit right here with a quarter inch shank. When these come in the mail, all right, we'll take a Sharpie. I'll write the date on them. We have a whole tooling rack like we said right here. I do not let these float around my drawer loosely. Unless it's something like this end mill, whether or not you can see it, these get hot dipped in a, uh, in a coating to protect your cutting edges. As long as the, uh, the dip is on them, I'll let them roll around in the drawer. Once I peel this off, they then go into a case, and uh, once my bits are dead and I throw them out, I save my cases, okay? That's pretty much about what I can come up with for everyone. Now, what we are going to do in the morning all right, is we're going to show you in VCAR Pro and Screen Capture. I want to go in and physically show you some of the programs and profiles as to how you can multitask with the end mills, how you can create some of the other patterns that you would go out and buy bits for, for say a router table. We're going to show you in, uh, in VCAR Pro how to go in and how to do a half a dozen different things to give you guys uh, a better idea of basically how to do them. Uh, and you know me, I don't I don't try to write, you know, in rocket science, and I, and I don't try to explain anything to any of you unless I can put it out there in a simple, easy to understand uh, context, okay? Well, for today, I hope everybody's had a great weekend. Of course, my subscribers, my followers, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, very, very much. Um, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. The dreaded Monday is here tomorrow, but by God, we do have a short week. So, you know, enjoy your upcoming holiday, and uh, we will see you all Wednesday for the midweek shout-out. We do have a couple things on deck here coming up this week. We've got another, uh, we've got another bed to go together, and I think if anybody's interested, uh, although these are just stock for the open market, I am going to go out, and we're going to do a big wildlife scene. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to do an equestrian scene, I think. I'm not 100% sure yet, but... I think we're going to do an equestrian scene, horses running across the open plains or something, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, okay? Again, everybody, enjoy what's left of your Sunday. I hope you all had a great week, and of course, thank you so much for your support, and we'll see you Wednesday for the midweek shout-out. All right, everybody, take care, be good, be safe, we'll see you Wednesday. Bye-bye.